Hello, good day, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. So before I jump into the video, I'm going to address the elephant in the room, which is this. The fact that I am now using a camera. Um, I mentioned it quite a few times, but I appreciate that not everyone is going to be able to keep up with everything that I say. Um, so to address that very simply, yes, I've got a camera. Uh, there is a reason for it, it's not just random. There's a few reasons. One, it makes it so much easier for me to edit because the editing process alone, after I've recorded everything, takes usually about six hours because I've got to try and edit all these clips together. Um, specifically, it's difficult because I need to find clips that are not copyrighted for obvious reasons. On top of that, as well as the fact that this makes it so much easier to edit because I've got something to work with, there is the fact that I feel as though when I'm engaging with some of the heavier stuff that I may possibly do on this channel, for instance maybe today, it's a lot easier for you guys to follow if you're looking at me seeing the words come out of my mouth as opposed to looking at something arbitrary on a screen which can perhaps be distracting. Um, so hopefully this will make it easier for you guys to follow as well as easier for me to edit. Um, a lot of people have been like, oh well Jack, you know, um, I thought you were trying to avoid giving, you know, doxing yourself, revealing too much information about you. Yes, well, I'm being careful for obvious reasons, though I think that because I'm so focused on economics, I'm, I'm not going to be making videos on anything particularly spicy or controversial, I shouldn't need to be too worried um, with what goes on, on on the YouTube channel that I run, so uh, I'm not too concerned. Um, I just got to be careful with the things I say because I realize people are controversial, but I highly doubt I'm going to get huge swarms of people calling for my head because I talk about the international financial system, about monetary policy, quantitative easing, things such as that. So, not too concerned. Anyway, with that established, we can jump into the video. So, a few weeks ago, the academic agent hosted an interesting stream. It was titled what happened in 1971, where he speculated an answer to precisely that question. I was set to be on the stream myself, but I decided to step down at the last minute, the reason being that Academic Agent was able to get the authors of the website dedicated to this question on, um, and so there were too many people, so I offered to step down, of course. Um, so whilst I'm not going to directly answer that question, it has inspired me to talk about something that is seldom discussed, I feel, by Austrian economists, which is developmental economics. Uh, the answer I had to some of the changes that occurred in the 1970s included the shift in industry away from the West and towards developing nations. Um, I feel like this is fairly indisputable. Some people call it globalization, some people call it internationalism. Either way, whatever you want to call it, there has undeniably, in, undeniably been a shift away from the industrial sector in the West, particularly in the United States, over to you, mainly the Far East, but all over the world. So I feel like I'm going to try and address this in this video somewhat. In this video I'm going to aim to discuss some theories as to how and why this process has occurred, as well as explaining two fairly recent papers that I feel provide unique answers to this discussion. So just to clarify, Whilst this paper, the one that is titled What Happened in 1971, has inspired me to make this video, in this video I don't actually intend to engage with that material, I don't actually intend to answer that question, instead I'm simply using this paper as a platform to jump onto what I want to talk about today, which is developmental economics and the shift from the West over to the East. Because one, as I say, this is something that the Austrians the Austrians engage with it, obviously. Basically, the, the theory the Austrians give is it's as a result of Keynesianism and higher labour laws and so on, and I will go over that later. Um, but developmental economics specifically, the advantages that developing nations have, this is developmental economics and how developing nations can catch up, essentially, uh, hasn't been addressed, and so I'm going to look into that today. Specifically, as I say, I'm going to be looking at a couple of papers, they're both links to each other, they're, one, they're also fairly recent, I think it was 2008-2014, I can't remember these exact dates, but it's 21st century papers these, so only a few years ago. A couple of papers, one was released, the other one was a follow-up to it. Um, one was by a more Keynesian-leaning economist, I think they're both neoclassical, but this one certainly leans more Keynesian if 
they aren't Keynesian. The other one is by a couple of authors who are both, I feel, looking at their conclusions and looking at some of the other papers they've done, um, I feel like they're more free market leaning neoclassicals. Um, so not Austrians, which is maybe the controversial point here, but I will bring Austrian economics in at the end. Um, but either way, I feel like these papers provide a couple of interesting theories which I hope to engage with. So before I jump into the developmental stuff, I want to find a segue from the what happened in 1971, what happened in the 1970s question. And so, you know, we can talk about some significant changes that occurred, particularly in the labour force in the United States. So as a result of the Vietnam War, the age of maturity was lowered in the United States from 21 to 18. Um, essentially, this meant that younger people could enter the workforce. Um, but specifically, it also lowered the age where women could make independent decisions about medical issues. And so this is part of the reason why there was a boom in contraception. Of course, the pill was introduced around this time um, because more women were choosing to undergo careers rather than stick with the family. And part of it was this policy that was introduced by Nixon, um, which was to lower the age of maturity. So obviously, this has quite significant repercussions on the US workforce. Um, more women are entering the workforce, more men are off fighting. Um, what this, if you look at the data, what this really meant was that more women were entering the administrative sectors and so on, which were pushing more men who were otherwise in these fields into higher positions. And slowly women were filtering out into more positions, but of course because they didn't have the same level of specialization because they hadn't been in these careers as long, it meant that they were taking the lower positions, pushing men up. It's all fairly obvious. Um, but the, as a result, there was a significant shift, but it also meant that there, were more, there was more power to be given to labor unions. And so this is where the Austrian theory comes in. It's because more power is given to labor unions, because more men are rising into more powerful positions, and there is a greater ammunition, essentially, of people in the workforce, combined with the dissent that was around at the time due to the Vietnam War and all of the other 60s and 70s politics that occurred, um, it, essentially unions got far more powerful. Um, and as a result, it became increasingly expensive for firms to hire in the West. I mean, you, one could argue that it became cheaper with more women entering the workforce, but the regulations that were introduced on the back of labour unions combined with all the strikes, particularly in the UK, of course, counted that out. On top of this, there was Nixon's shock. So this was Nixon's response to inflation at the time. Uh, he introduced wage and price freezes. I'm not going to address this in these policies in this video, but I'm sure most of you are aware that these are not good policies. As a result, it had a significant harmful effect on the US economy. And so I would argue that the main reason for a lot of the graphs, I mean, obviously there are a multitude of reasons, but some of the main reasons for the graphs that are shown on the What Happened in 1971 website are these factors, as well as the collapse of Bretton Woods, the rise in fiat money and monetary policy, and the movement of capital to developing nations, which is the rise of globalization, which is what we're going to focus on here. Sorry if the lighting is not so good. Um, it's that kind of twilight sort of evening. It's around, it's eight o'clock right now in the evening. So, and it's of course the middle of the summer and so it's still light outside, but it's not light enough to light in here. Of course, I don't have proper lighting to set up with this camera. Plus I'm still fiddling around with the settings. Hopefully it won't be too much of an issue for you guys. I'm still gonna try and upload in 1080p. Um, but if the quality is a bit lower, it's because of the lighting. And I'm sorry for that. There's not much I can really do. Those of you who are wondering why I've got a Mac here, um, I don't game on this Mac, because I know that's what most of you will be thinking. Um, I have my own gaming PC that I built for that stuff. Anyway, on to the actual video. So I'm going to start by talking about the financial system a bit. So in international finance, there is what is known as the impossible trinity. So the impossible trinity means that you can only have two of the following three things. This is it any one given time. So the three things are fixed exchange rates, one, 
high mobility of capital, and the third one is monetary autonomy. You can only have at most two of these three things at any one time. I feel like it's fairly self-explanatory. Obviously there's clashes with the three of them. I mean specifically how do you have monetary autonomy if you've got fixed exchange rates? And of course there is the influence that mobility of capital is had upon monetary autonomy and on fixed exchange rates. So this is why it's a triangle, but you can only have two at most at one time. This is the impossible trinity. And so given that the Bretton Woods system, which had been in place prior to this point, was a system of fixed exchange rates, many nations lacked either high mobility of capital or monetary autonomy. This is at minimum both of these. So for the first period of the Bretton Woods era, it was fairly cold storage. However, following 1958, things began to fall apart. This is when the IMF began to get a bit more involved in the system. Specifically, they were more involved in lending, which meant there were two consequences. There was more debt in the system, and there was a greater availability of US dollars in the system. And as well as this, European nations, many of them, became convertible. And so, as a result, the quantity of US dollars abroad inflated. This is one of the main reasons why Bretton Woods collapsed. Uh, it's also very similar to the situation between the US and China right now. I've actually done a video kind of discussing this. Um, I'd recommend you go check it out. I'll put a link maybe somewhere on screen if I can, if I remember. If not, video description. And if I forget to do that, then just go on my channel. It's, it's got the picture of Trump and Xi Jinping on... Um, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but it's something about the threat that China poses to the US economy. Essentially, the, the similarity is that the Chinese yen is pegged to the US dollar, with the Chinese purchasing US treasuries in order to keep stability between the exchange rate. So a very, very similar scenario to what, her, what occurred with Bretton Woods. Anyway, all of this means that there is somewhat of an effective control over some of the monetary policies that the US engages with. Following the 1973 collapse of Bretton Woods, these limitations were removed, of course. And the US were free to follow a much more relaxed monetary policy, whilst international currencies gained monetary autonomy slash high mobility of capital. The impossible trinity, as we talk about. So the one fixed exchange rate is gone, which frees up the possibility for both of the other two. So this brings us on to another general rule about international finance, and this rule is that there are generally three types of financial market. There are the stock markets, the foreign exchange markets, and the bond markets, and these three forms of market are all intertwined. So for instance, when one or two begin to fail, the other tends to do quite well, because of course people move their money around and they want to invest in whichever one is most stable. A really good example of this would actually be what I believe has been occurring recently. Um, I believe that... What we saw, particularly in the US, with the coronavirus pandemic, at the start was a concern about the stability of the stock market. Obviously there was a high, le high level of volatility risk in the market, the VIX index, so as a result, people were not investing as much. They weren't taking the risks that they otherwise would do. Understandable, considering there was a virus going on. And so what the US government tried to do was actually sacrifice the bond market somewhat, um, particularly with equities, uh, in the hope that by doing this, certainly by reducing the yield level of bonds, then more money would flow out of the bond market and into the stock market. This is, of course, kind of why the stock market recovered a lot quicker than anything else, among many other reasons. Um, another example of this would be people moving their money outside of the US dollar, which of course has been losing value, and into ETFs on the stock market, so gold, for instance. And of course people have been buying physical commodities, but it's a bit more difficult to do that than to buy ETFs on NASDAQ. So anyway, just the key takeaway is that these, there are these three markets, the foreign exchange market, the, uh, the stock market, and the bond market, and they're all interlinked, they're all interrelated. The collapse of Bretton Woods and the sudden high mobility of capital, particularly to European nations at the time, meant that there was a lot of money to be made in foreign currencies. So, 
think about what I just said, think about the effects that this has. Furthermore, the bond market during this period began to inflate. Additionally, in 1975, OPEC, so this is the big petroleum organization of nations, decided to invest surplus oil proceeds into US government debt securities. So at this, this is at the same meeting where they agreed to keep using the US dollar as the reserve currency for trading oil. This is something that I might actually make a video on in the future because it's quite interesting, the, the use of the US dollar in oil markets. Um, especially with the way that the Chinese and the Russians are currently approaching it. Anyway, I've gone off topic. Anyway, so all of the things that I just mentioned meant a fall in the index of US dollar. People began moving their money out of the US dollar and into the bond market or into foreign currencies. So furthermore, several other things, such as the collapse of the stock market, which can be seen in the decline in Dow between 1971 and 1975, Nixon's surcharge on imports, uh, and also the expansionary monetary policy that was occurring during the era meant that the US dollar lost value. So all of this meant that as well as people were moving their money into other markets, so the bond market, the foreign exchange, foreign currency markets, um, people also started investing more in assets and commodities, such as gold, which explains the increase in the price of gold at the time, uh, and also oil prices spikes due to its inverse relationship with the US dollar, which, as I say, maybe I'll talk about when I do this oil video, but because oil prices are, or were at the time, it's starting to change now, but always in US dollar, as I said, OPEC agreed in 1975, there's an inverse relationship. Ultimately, the final blow, which was the expansionary monetary policy, which was seen very heavily in the early 1970s, meant that easy access to credit resulted in several things. So you had malinvestment, you had inflation, you had stagnation in domestic markets, uh, and also second, you had a significant increase in the kind of high time preference culture that would gradually come to define the 80s, um, and then the periods afterwards, including today. So in many ways, monetary policy is a factor, and this is a lot of the stuff that the Austrians do talk about. Obviously, high time preference is a pretty big thing. Obviously, it can be linked to the increase in expansionary monetary policy, the lowering of interest rates. It created a kind of culture of in-the-moment gratification. Um, people are more willing to purchase cheap commodities, um, which generally you're more likely to find in developing nations, particularly because of the reasons that I'm about to go into to get into the real heart of things. So all of the things I've kind of mentioned so far in this video are setting the stage for the movement of capital from Western industry to abroad. First really occurs in Europe, especially in the 90s with the collapse of the Soviet Union and you get countries, particularly in Eastern Europe, starting to develop more. Then of course elsewhere we mainly think of the Chinese, but it's also you know, Vietnam, Myanmar, slash Burma, these are really big, especially right now. So really, these are the first signs of globalization. So, two of the papers that I want to bring up, which attempt to explain the phenomenon of the advantage of developing nations, the ability particularly for developing nations to latch on to the opportunity that was provided for the aforementioned reasons. And these two papers are Real Exchange Rate and Economic Growth by Danny Roderick, released in 2008, this was the original paper, and then the follow-up, Exchange Rate Misalignment and Economic Growth, a myth, and I'll put both the papers, including their authors, in the description. So in order to assess the link between real exchange rates and economic growth, which is kind of the heart that Roderick in his initial paper is getting at, as to the reason why developing nations get this advantage, uh, Roderick made this undervaluation index this index reflects real exchange rates. And he compared this undervaluation index with economic growth rates for several countries, particularly developing countries. These included growth rates for the likes of China, India, South Korea, Taiwan, Uganda, Tanzania, and Mexico. And all of this was across the period between 1950 and 2004. So to go into the specific details on how this index was made, the undervaluation index, which, as I've just stated, was used and compared to economic growth in the aforementioned countries, was made first by taking an overvaluation index to calculate real exchange rate. 
So the way this is done was data on exchange rates was divided by PPP, so purchasing power parity. Obviously, the maths involved, not Austrian, but stick with it. If the result was greater than one on the final calculation that they managed to get, then it indicates that the value of the currency is lower or it's more depreciated than the PPE, PPP, the purchasing power parity. Okay, so that's established. Next, the Balassa-Samuelson model was taken into account. Now, I feel like I should explain what Balassa-Samuelson is before I go any further. So, anyone who's studied a kind of basic bachelor's level of economics or international finance should know what the Balassa-Samuelson model is. It's extremely famous. In short, I don't want to go too into too much detail on Balassa-Samuelson because that's not the point in this video. Uh, according to the Balassa-Samuelson theory, consumer prices are likely to be higher in more developed nations than less developed nations. So you get two types of goods, according to this theory, in an economy. You have tradables and you have non-tradables. I feel like they're explained in the name, but non-tradables would be things such as having your hair cut, so a hairdresser, whereas tradables would be a big manufacturing plant, such as, um, I don't know, like a car company that ships abroad. That would be a tradable, non-tradable, you go get a beer, you go get a haircut. Not something that you can trade. Anyway, the Balassa Samuelson model essentially says that you have tradables which tend to set wages and non-tradables which tend to rely on wages to set their prices tend to be similar in productivity. Anyway, the idea is at first with the developing nation the tradables are less productive in poorer countries but due to the exchange rate, especially the case if you have some sort of fixed exchange rate, more money flows in which increases the productivity of tradables. As a result, wages increase, the increase in wages essentially tend to filter through into non-tradables, it helps to set higher prices and so as a result the whole country develops. This can especially be seen in the competitive nature of the workforce. So if a tradable company, so you've got some car plant, decides to increase their wages because they're getting more investment from abroad, um, mainly because of the cheaper availability of capital due to the exchange rate, then this reflects in the non-tradables because they increase their wages. As a result, more people want to work in the tradables, and so in order to remain competitive, the non-tradables increase their wages. So, long story short, you have non-tradables, tradables, exchange rate. The exchange rate means that the tradables increase in value which pushes up the non-tradables and so there's this balassa samuelson advantage to developing nations and it's all connected to the exchange rate. Okay, that's established. Anyway, the balassa samuelson model is used in Roderick's paper because of the idea that due to the balassa samuelson effect, non-tradables are initially cheaper in less developed nations. balassa samuelson is specifically taken into account by taking the real exchange rate and regressing it from the per capita GDP. So, yes, once again, lots of neoclassical stuff. If you're Austrian, just ignore this. The theories can also be taken deductively, and the maths can be somewhat ignored here. Anyway, so once we've done all this, we actually need to get to the undervalue, undervaluation, because the previous model I spoke about was the overvaluation index, which leads to the undervaluation index. So the undervaluation is calculated by taking the real exchange rate, we spoke about with the overvaluation, from the balassa samuelson adjusted rate. And so this undervaluation index is then compared with the growth rates. Um, I believe Roderick, he compared to the growth rates of a maximum of around 184 countries within the specified period. So Roderick's original conclusion, before we move on to the second paper for this whole um, theory that he came up with, is that the concerning the relationship between exchange rates and growth, High real exchange rates, so this is an undervalued currency, stimulate economic growth. Of course, a lot of the focus is on developing nations here because developing nations are more likely to have an undervalued currency than developed nations. To kind of briefly give some of the reasons beyond the maths and the methodology that I've already outlined, among the various reasons that Roderick believed this was the case, included the fact that sustained real exchange rate depreciations make it more profitable to invest in tradables, which as I said, if you factor into account Balassa Samuelson, also increase the average level of GDP per capita in the country, 
because they also force the wages for non-tradables to increase. And also these real exchange rate depreciations act to alleviate the economic cost of these distortions. And so ultimately, what is the final result? Well, what we see is that periods of undervaluation in a currency are correlated with higher economic growth, notably in developing nations. Now, really, a greater explanation on the importance of real exchange rate is warranted. Uh, and Roderick does provide a few explanations. So he says that prior to all of this, an underdeveloped nation has several problems. Specifically, poor institutions within underdeveloped nations have a static misallocation of resources. This is because poor institutions are more prone to a lot of different factors, such as the inability to properly enforce contract law, uh, lack of proper property rights, contractual incompleteness, corruption, all of these things are far more prevalent in underdeveloped nations, for, I think, fairly obvious reasons. As a result, this diminishes the level of growth. Once again, I think that this is all fairly obvious. It means that people are, less, are going to be far less likely to be investing capital in these companies out of a kind of paranoia that they're not going to get return. It hinders technological progression. It hinders capital accumulation across the board. Roderick, Interestingly, it also states that this problem is far more prevalent in tradables than non-tradables. So I think that's because of the size of the business and the potential level for corruption within a lot of underdeveloped nations means that tradables are going to be able to push people around a bit more than you would have in a private, well-enforced, competitive market. Not to mention the fact that the production system within tradables is far, far, far more complex than non-tradables. Anyway, so the importance here is the fact that Changing real exchange rates allow these things to change, which means that developing nations are able to suddenly shoot up. So if we take the Blaster Samuelson and we take what we mentioned before about how the undervalued real exchange rate leads to an increase in the price of tradables, then we can come to several conclusions. As we just mentioned, Roderick believes that tradables are particularly prone to these problems, but if they're getting more outside investment coming into them, then they're going to be more likely to allocate resources properly, which, as Roderick states, is a huge, huge, huge factor for keeping underdeveloped nations underdeveloped. Another explanation that Roderick gives for the impact that real exchange rates have are that when a nation is underdeveloped, once again, we're going to be talking particularly about tradables, uh, tradables are going to be more prone to market failures, quote-unquote, if market failure is a thing. An example that he gives would be the credit market imperfections, although I think to throw in an Austrian perspective here, we would say that this isn't market failure but government failure because it's central banks who often cause these credit market uh, failures. And also learning externalities. Once again, not really a problem with the market. So anyway, he calls it market failure, let's call it government failure, it doesn't matter what it is, but either way, there are these problems. His idea is that real exchange rate depreciation increases the capacity of these tradables, and as a result, they're able to deal with these issues that we've just mentioned in a much easier manner, making economic growth easier. So you could think of this whole scenario as one where underdeveloped nations have several problems hampering them, but as soon as you open up the foreign exchange market, their undervalued currency, the high real exchange rate, means that suddenly they're able to get the capital to deal with these problems and suddenly they have a huge advantage due to the balassa samuelson effect to compete with developed nations. Anyway, so that is the first paper established. With that established, let's move on to the second paper. Now, as I say, this is a more recent paper. I believe it was released around 2014. I can't remember exactly, but it doesn't matter so much, I don't think. Just know that it's fairly recent. Uh, I believe these guys are a bit more free market leaning. They've done quite a few interesting works before, as I'm going to attempt to put on the screen here for you to see. Um, they, they seem to indicate suddenly a concern with things such as inflation, and also in the report that we're about to go through, the paper that we're about to go through, you'll see that they consider savings to be an extremely important factor, which generally is a more free market response to these sorts of issues. Anyway, they say that this effect is still in place, that there seems to be some sort of link between exchange rates and developing nations, and so they agree with a lot of the stuff that Roderick says. However, they have some serious doubts about some of the other stuff that he says, so let's go into detail. 
Certainly they say that real exchange rate deviations and some sort of real exchange rate devaluation is positively correlated with growth, particularly in developing nations, and so they agree that Roderick certainly got some of that right. The debate really then is to why this is the case. To quote the report, they say, We follow closely Roderick, 2008, which finds evidence that a depreciated real exchange rate tends to boost growth based on a panel of countries. His results are particularly strong for a subsample of developing economies. However, their conclusion is that there is a significant factor that he didn't account for in his initial paper. This factor is, as I've already hinted at, savings. They conclude that the exclusion of savings in Roderick's initial study could have misrepresented the upward effect of the real exchange rate. And so their belief is that increased savings lead to currency depreciation, as well as increased growth. And so it was erroneous to leave such an important variable out of the study. So in other words, they say that savings, rather than Balassa Samuelson, have quite a significant impact on the undervaluation of real exchange rates. They don't really address the Balassa Samuelson model enough to say whether or not they entirely disagree with it. But certainly they seem to indicate, as many economists do, that an undervalued currency increases growth because you get more capital into that economy. I think that's fairly self-explanatory. And so the question is, well, what leads to um, these sort of effects coming about? And they believe that savings are a much bigger factor than any sort of investment or any of the other factors that I went through with Roderick. Certainly it would be easy to take these reports and say it's an and or or. It's either the increased price of tradables, which is the more Balassa Samuelson route, or it's the increased level of savings in the economy. Um, which, as I mentioned, and also as I have noted in several of my other videos, is quite significant on its impact with current accounts due to the twin deficit hypothesis. So one could think that it's an either-or scenario, but really it is possible to say, well, maybe it's both. My own conclusion, which isn't noted by either report, kind of brings the Austrian business cycle into this. So as I say, the Austrians don't actually engage with this stuff. Not really, not anything that I've read. Um, I'm to be taking... Austrian theory and applying it to this scenario, particularly with the savings. So Roderick, in his initial report, states that poor institutions are particularly vulnerable to issues such as contractual incompleteness, um, and as a result this is particularly harmful for tradables in market sectors. So my belief is rather than Balassa Samuelson necessarily coming in and increasing the profitability of tradables, an increase in the, real, in the level of real savings, which is backed investment, uh, in a developing economy is going to reduce malinvestment and as a result reduces a lot of these issues, leading to more stable economic growth, reducing the likelihood of credit contraction. Now, you may be wondering, okay, well, what's the point? What's this got to do with developing nations? Um, you know, at least with the real exchange rate, we had a link between what I said earlier with the undervaluation of the US dollar. Well, this is to link all the way back to what the US did in the 70s and the other Western countries, which was to enact expansionary monetary policy. As a result, they essentially created malinvestment, um, and so people began investing outside of US markets into foreign markets, and this greater availability of investment that meant that more people were going to be comfortable saving. Now, you may be thinking, well, hold on, more money in, Surely that would cause malinvestment because more people are going to spend rather than save. Well, no, the significant difference between them and the problem with the business cycle in the West is that they haven't been going around attempting to increase the money supply or to increase investment with low interest rates. So this is the core here. Maintaining higher interest rates means that savings occur rather than investment. As a result, their growth comes mainly through businesses operating in a more efficient manner, particularly in the tradable sector, which then filters through to so non-tradables, rather than people simply investing and consuming like the Keynesians would have you believe. So savings are a significant part of this. Anyway, if any of this doesn't make sense, I'll try and link the studies in the video description. You can read them for yourself. Um, maybe they're fairly complicated for those of you who aren't economists, but with time, I'm sure you could tackle them. If you just don't understand a term, then look it up in another tab. But certainly they're really interesting things. Anyway, this leads on to the next part of the video, which is the Austrian take. Well, why don't the Austrians really engage with developmental economics as much as you might think, especially when you can see the conclusions I've come to heavily rely on monetary policy and on the level of savings in an economy? 
Well, I'd say that there's a few reasons. One, I think that it's incredibly hard to sell developmental economics to non-economists, and the reason for this is that it quickly spirals away from economics into this country versus that country. So, let's say we take China and the US here. Rather than looking at, okay, well, what financial factors have meant that China have had this advantage, where's the link to exchange rates, it quickly becomes, particularly to the layman, uh, a competition between the US and China. It, it becomes a black and white sort of dichotomy between two countries rather than looking at it purely in terms of finance or economics, which isn't how the Austrians really want to go about selling this stuff. Um, it also has significant issues when you think that Austrian economics is more individualist. The state is not really as important to them as it is for maybe other groups of individuals, particularly in philosophy or economics. Um, and, and also there's the whole idea about the allocation of resources, right? To the Austrians, it doesn't matter if one country is poorer than another or one country develops faster than another, so long as it is the market allocating resources in the most efficient manner. As Lionel Robbins says, the point in economics is to ensure that uh, scarce resources scarce resources that have alternative uses are allocated in the most efficient manner possible. This is the point in an economy, is to reduce the waste of materials, it's to ensure the 100% maximum efficiency in the way that goods, and services, commodities, including labour, are moved around. Right? And so if we completely leave it to the market, it doesn't matter how fast one country is developing, it doesn't matter how slow one country is developing, because it's all a reaction to materials being moved around in the most efficient manner possible, which supply and demand does ensure. And so I'd say this is why the Austrians aren't so concerned with this stuff, but it is nonetheless quite an interesting thing to think about, certainly with Trump recently and his responses to China. You know, people are very upset, well, why is our industry moving away? What can we do to stop it? And I'm hoping that this, combined with my video on China, will give a deeper explanation for why starting a trade war, putting tariffs onto things isn't going to help. Because even if you do these things, the opportunity for investors to put capital into other countries, mainly because of the exchange rate opportunities, means that it doesn't matter how much tariffs are going to cost, the capital will still lead to a growth in developing nations. So really there's not much that can be done on that front. Um, I think that if Western countries really want to prevent big corporations from moving over to Asia or wherever it may be they want to go and, and invest in, they need to really look at the home front rather than trying to cut things off. Um, they need to take out the stem essentially. Why are, why are corporations moving abroad? Well, you could say that it's the cheap labour in China, or well, China in the 90s, now it would be Vietnam, Myanmar, places like that. Well, you know, maybe the issue is that labour's too expensive in the West. Maybe the power of unions, maybe the regulations, minimum wage and so on, have resulted in this happening. Maybe it's the fact that these are big corporations, like Apple, that are going and doing this. Well, these big corporations are far less likely to actually exist in a free market, because they rely very heavily on government subsidies. Maybe it's the level of tax in Western countries. Who knows what it is, but these are all significant factors. Not to mention, as I have been heavily implying throughout, the business cycle and the role of monetary policy. Low interest rates, combined with quantitative easing, have absolutely killed the economies in Western countries, and something does need to be seriously done about this. Fiat currency is out of control, especially now in 2020. And there are so many negative effects. Frankly, I could make a million videos on this channel just talking about the negative effects of expansionary monetary policy with fiat currency. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, sorry if the quality has not been great, the sound quality, the lighting, the visual quality. I'm still getting used to using this camera. It's very new. Um, regardless, I hope you understood the video. I hope you enjoyed the video. If there's anything you want me to clarify, just let me know. Um, if you disagree with me, then let me know. I'm very open to hearing your opinions on the subject. Please feel free to comment, to like, subscribe. Please follow me on Twitter and Discord. Or join my Discord, should I say. Both of them are in the description. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Goodbye, guys.